Hi, everyone. Doc T here. Welcome to another episode of the Horse Advocate Podcast. This one's going to be relatively short because I'm at the tail end of a long trip and I'm just trying to squeeze this in and try and get it out here somewhat on time. But I thought of something very important to say as I went from farm to farm this this past couple of weeks and that is to establish what my mission statement really is. I have a tagline, which many of you heard, called Helping Horses Thrive in a Human World. And I thought I wanted to take a little bit of time to explain what I mean there. When I talk about a horse thriving, I'm seeing horses everywhere not thriving. They are surviving. They are existing. Uh, whether it's mentally or physically, uh, these horses are in loving hands of caregivers, and there's really no harm in most of these. In fact, the horses I see, obviously, they are taking good care of them because they are taking care of their teeth. But I know that there's lots of horses I pass on the side of the road that I'm not sure if they're getting the best care. And I don't know. I wouldn't know unless I actually go in there and ask the questions. But I have to assume that a lot of them aren't based on what I see in their surrounding environment and their hair coats and top lines and other pieces of evidence that show me that the horses aren't thriving. But when I talk about thriving, I think about a horse that's turned loose and living a uh, thousand years ago. Are they thriving? Well, they're thriving as much as humans did you know, several thousand years ago, where all they had was what existed out there. They had no pantries, they had no refrigerators, they had no shipping in of Amazon of foods that we want from places far away. They only had what was in front of them. And if they didn't like it, they had to actually move through migration to other places. So theoretically, they thrived because their uh, bodies had evolved to live on what they were given. And through the winter months, it got really tough on them. If they didn't move far enough, they got cold, they didn't get the food they needed, and they might even die of starvation. Or if some plague came by or fires came by, uh, it would devoid their ability to have food, which on the other hand, they are really genius because you can plop a horse almost anywhere on this planet and there would be food for them to eat because if it's growing on the ground, they can eat it, basically. Uh, you and I, though, uh, have to go and hunt or fish for our meat. And if we ate vegetables, it's whatever's growing on the ground or in a tree. We didn't even have seeds or cultivation devices or plows. We just lived on what we could find. And did we thrive? Well, it depends on your definition. Obviously, if you um, look back on when we moved into cities and people, other people provided for us our food from farming or from games, um, you know, hunting, uh, we started to thrive. We could start focusing on other things. And there's a good argument, not to get political, but just bear out, bear the, bear with me for a moment. If we were, if we had to spend our time figuring out how to uh, survive in this world. Um, and I don't mean going to work, but I mean actually going out to hunt and fish and um, uh, cultivate and create farms. We wouldn't have time to worry about our genders <laughs> or uh, what other people think of us. We did worry about our neighbors coming in and invading and taking away from us and small skirmishes and battles have always occurred. Uh, it's just because we have so much time to think now. Um, we're not worried about hunger. We're not worried about having enough money to pay our bills or getting a roof over our head. For most of us, most of us listening to this are not homeless. Um, we now worry about politics. And uh, that's about as much as I want to talk about politics here on the Hor Horses Advocate, because this isn't a place for that. It's just building a framework to understand what thriving is. And with thriving, we now have stalls, we have um, 
fans that keep them cool. We have sheets that keep the flies off of them or blankets to keep them warm. Uh, we even have heaters built into our barns. Uh, we have beautiful bedding. Uh, and now I'm seeing more and more studies being done by equine behaviorists that are trying to analyze, is a stall the best thing for a horse? Uh, what kind of hay feeding system should we have? Should we have bags that have just one netting or two or or triple bagged so the holes are so small that makes it much harder for them to make their um, get their ingested foods over a period of time? And people are actually studying this, and I get to read their reports. And of course, the number of horses that they do these reports on are maybe five or ten horses, and it's not it's not really good science, but it's the only science we've got. And we're trying to draw conclusions from that. And it's frustrating because it goes back to what can constitutes thriving uh, for a horse. Uh, thriving, a lot of you would say is having, um, you know, 20 acres for like two or three horses where they have grass that's knee high and they get to bound and be free and yet they can come in to a shelter on their own um, when they want to and feel safe. They're not being preyed upon because everyone likes to talk about the predator aspect of uh, horses or the prey aspect from predators. And we keep them pretty much safe because we live in neighborhoods that don't have bobcats and snakes and bears, or do we? because they're being encroached upon and we're seeing more and more of them in urban areas. So we're just trying to help horses thrive by giving information on this broad podcast and on the website to make their lives better, but not to make them so, so much better that they get worse. And that's where the second part of the equation comes in in a human world. So helping horses thrive in a human world, humanity is now trying to make their lives so comfortable that they are now getting more and more diseases. And it's so frustrating because a lot of these diseases didn't occur back in the 1980s when I went to vet school. They're not in the textbooks. And you've heard me say this a dozen times and I'll say it a dozen more times until people understand that in our efforts as humans to make their horses, our horses thrive, we could possibly not make them thrive at all. We could actually be hurting them with obesity, metabolic syndrome. We see it in humans. I, obesity is the number one problem in America right now. Uh, atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of humans. And it doesn't have to occur and if you've been listening to my podcast, you know that I've been saying this is caused by um, blood glucose and free blood glucose not bound to insulin is damaging our blood vessels and creating lesions in them where the low density lipoproteins or the LDLs or what everyone calls bad cholesterol, which is not really correct because LDL is not a cholesterol, it is a protein. These proteins get lodged in these nooks and crannies caused by the damage of free glucose. And if the LDLs have low particle size um, uh, fats, uh, they can get lodged in there and they start to accumulate and that leads to the plaque formation. And all we have to do is stop, number one, stop eating sugar in excess of our daily needs. And that will stop the damage to the lining of the of the arterials because we'll have enough insulin to take care of that. And two, if we start eating more of a high fat diet and, and low carbohydrate diet, then the particle size in the low density lipoproteins will actually get larger and they won't embed into the walls. They just bounce off kind of like a beach ball floating on water versus a golf ball that sinks in water. So it's a low particle size. So I know this about horses, but I want to extrapolate from that a hypothesis that I've got for laminitis in our horses. Now, laminitis occurred in ponies back in the 1980s, but it's pretty rare in horses. And yet we're seeing laminitis in horses all the time. 
and we're calling it insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome with secondary uh, laminitis. So what's truly happening here? Is it possible that glucose from the high sugar content of uh, the grains that we feed and the haze that we feed and the modified grasses that we're planting that are made for increased uh, milk production in cows and increased meat production in cattle, is it possible that these uh, high flutin, high flutin, uh, high, highly, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, um, developed grasses that we're now putting in our pastures, is that sugar content too high for horses? And is that causing increased blood glucose? And is that increasing inflammation in the arterioles? Well, if all this sugar can cause increased inflammation in the arteries of the horses, uh, of the humans, why can't it occur in the horses? And why not it occurring in the lamina? The fine mesh network of the highly developed hoof that is so unique to horses, could it possibly be causing this inflammation that when they get this sugar load of uh, fructose in the high fructans spring grass goes down there and creates uric acid and more uh, glucose and fructose inflammation, could that be causing the inflammation that we're seeing in the um, in the blood vessels and that leads to laminitis? That coupled with um, lack of protein, specifically methionine, that's converted to cysteine and they're double sulfur bonds, those double sulfide bonds are what create the strength of the hoof. And if we're low in that, plus we're getting inflammation, I think the result is laminitis. Obviously, if you take your somewhat laminated horse and start soaking the hay and restrict pasture, so the sugar content dips way below their daily needs, and you increase the amount of methionine available through either the addition of soybean meal or somebody's manufactured methionine, um, these laminated horses will no longer be laminitic. They'll start running around with sound hoofs. I mean, I'm seeing this all over the world. People are getting back to me about this happening. So without trying to be a rocket scientist, let's just pay attention to what these horses are supposed to be doing and making sure that they are um, being fed the way they have evolved to be fed. So again, in a human world, we are trying to make these horses perform better. Uh, we push them a little bit further. We genetically engineer them by our breeding programs. We start to crossbreed warm blood, uh, hot bloods and cold bloods together to get warm bloods. We start to feed them uh, excess energy to make them perform better in the false belief that eat, eating grain gives them more energy. And that's just not, tr not true. Uh, it gives them more sugar, which if they can be used, will provide energy, quick energy. But if it can't be used, it's converted into body fat. And that body fat adds poundage that this horse has to carry around and lift off the ground to jump over a fence. And it also creates sluggishness both in the brain and everywhere else. So And so they don't recover as fast because the mitochondria aren't used to um, using fat as fuel. They only know how to use sugar as fuel. So this is a, a long story condensed into short words that I've been trying to do at the Horses Advocate. I've been trying to assess what we're trying to do in a human world to our horses that the simple question is, is it helping them thrive or not? And I'm finding that the more we try to add with supplements and with foods uh, and with medicines, the more medicines that have to be given because our horses are breaking down and they're getting sick and they're just not uh, surviving. They're not thriving, <laughs> let alone surviving. They're dying on us. So helping horses thrive in a human world is my mission statement. And the whole purpose of the Horse Advocate is to dig in and find out what's going on. I will tell you that over the past three weeks, as I've traveled all over the South um, from Florida out to Louisiana and then through Tennessee and Georgia, um, I've, I've seen a lot of indications that we're not doing that great a job. And I've seen a lot of indications where we're doing a great job. Those clients who are listening to what I say, they're having horses with great hair coats, top lines are coming back, they're not uh, lame, uh, things seem to be working well. <clears throat> but I had one horse that was 
getting thinner. He's 30 or 31 years old. And uh, one vet had come in and said, you need to get this horse off all grain and just put it on forage-based diets and forget the supplements. And of course, this veterinarian is an older veterinarian who's more of a horseman who understands how horses respond to these things. But the owner decided to find another veterinarian to get his opinion. And that vet said, you need to be feeding a lot of senior feed and uh, adding all these supplements. And the horse is getting worse on this program because she elected to add more food. And the horse gets thinner and gets more edgier. And so she and I decided to look at the ingredients on the senior feed. And yes, there's soybean meal in there, but not enough. There's alfalfa meal, but she already had a flake of alfalfa in there. And those are the only two positive ingredients. There's a third one that had whey protein in there, and that's fine. But all the other ingredients were suspect as far as inflammation or where they were made or where's the guaranteed analysis at what's on the labels in the, in the package. So they had all these um, vitamins and minerals to which I don't think horses really need if they're getting groundwater and a salt lick and their gut microbiome is correct, they should be getting all the vitamins and minerals they need. <laughs> Pardon me. But then there's also... Um, so many inflammatory foods, wheat middlings, rice hulls, soybean oil, soybean hulls, um, and, and, and um, flaxseed and sugar beet pulp. All these are, I said, this is all byproducts of human um, food. And there's no uh, real reason. They talk about it being a um, uh, high glycemic food. That means it moves through the small intestine and can feed the gut microbiome. But I'm saying there's really not a lot of proof that that actually helps the horse and creates a good gut microbiome. And here you are feeding more and more food. I think it's like nine quarts and the horse is getting thinner. And obviously it ain't working. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at gut microbiome uh, activity. They're doing a lot of research up in Guelph Canada vet school, uh, but in humans, they're doing tons and associating autism, uh, depression, and anxiety to a bad gut microbiome in humans, and that we can start to change that. And I personally have decided to experiment with a probiotic for humans that's double encapsulated, so the outer capsule can't be digested until it hits the hindgut and the bacteria digest it. And when it does, it releases a inner capsule that has a gut microbes that we need for the hindgut to make them healthy. And it was interesting because my wife just explained to me that this is the first time in a long time that I've been on a trip where I haven't complained that I'm not home, I'm not sleeping in my own bed, uh, I'm missing my family, uh, but I'm more copacetic. I'm not, not having this funk that occurs and don't get worried about me, I'm doing fine. But uh, and I know that, that that happens, I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, but this time I'm really excited about it as I move from day to day, I look at each case, I'm in the moment, I'm present. And the only thing we can attribute that to or possibly attribute it to is the taking of this probiotic for us. Um, and I might do a podcast specifically on that in the future when I have more data on my own personal uh, development with that. Uh, I'm also trying another experiment where I'm actually taking in uh, ketones in an outside source, which has never been heard of before. We, we can only make ketones and make that a fuel for us, but now ketones are available to take in and I take uh, ketones in the morning and now I double that and I take it also in the evening. And my sleep scores are getting better. My ability to uh, remember names, uh, things, uh, to do these podcasts without any notes, just have a clear understanding in my mind what I want. Uh, the brain fog keeps getting clearer and clearer. So I'll probably do a podcast on that and talk about it. Um, that's helping me thrive in, in, in a human world. And I'm trying to extrapolate some of these things to help your horses thrive in a human world. Um, I'm also bringing in other people uh, in the future. I've got a, a gal coming in to talk about how she uses damaged horses to help damaged humans. And I think that's going to be a really interesting podcast coming up. I can't wait to do that recording. And I've got another fellow who is in charge of a hospital, a vet a vet school hospital, uh, one of our vet schools in North America. 
and he's going to help me dig down deep and figure out what's going on with our problem of getting good people to become horse vets and stay in the business. So that'll be a really good, interesting podcast. Oh, also, I was invited to the uh, Lincoln Memorial University's vet school, which is their brand new uh, and second veterinary school in the state of Tennessee. And I was able to give them a talk. Uh, and it was about equine dentistry. And I laughed because there's about 30 people in the room, maybe 40, I can't remember, didn't count accurately, but they were all there and they had to have attendance. So they all got a point. Uh, and as they accumulate points, um, as they hit a certain goal, uh, they can be in the student chapter of the AVMA. And I thought that was funny. So I started my whole talk and saying, okay, all of you here, I know are here just to collect your points. And I get that. No big deal. And I also know that almost all of you here are into small animals who care less about horses. And I get that. So I know I'm only talking to, you know, three or four of you, but let me tell you what I know about equine dentistry and how it relates to veterinary medicine and how it will make you a better veterinarian overall. And somehow I was able to put together on the fly a discussion for these uh, students that with only two people getting up and leaving and, you know, two out of 30 or 40, I think is acceptable. The rest of them, their eyes stayed glued to me. I mean, I kept looking around the room and I kept seeing everybody's eyes. They weren't down, you know, looking through, scrolling through their phone or, you know, ho-humming it or doing something else. Almost without exception, they all kept their eyes on me because I talked about what juices us, what gets us out of bed and wants to work with animals, whether it's dogs and cats or, you know, pigs, cattle, turtles, or horses, and what drives us to get out there. <clears throat> and it's our desire to help them thrive in a human world, basically. And it's not to automatically sedate and make them just units or numbers on a spreadsheet. It's to <clears throat> make their lives better. And that really got everyone's attention. And then I said, um, there's a problem with veterinary medicine that we're all being yes men or yes women, yes people. It's, it's trying to make us, um, what, do, what do I want to call it? Um, fixers and not problem solvers, not getting in there and trying to um, look at root causes and prevent. Because if we prevent disease, it's like making the perfect car. Uh, they don't need a service technician anymore. So there's a bunch of people out of work. So I know that we all want to be um, uh, preventing these diseases, but the vets also want to be around to fix them. And that's an agenda-driven profession. And we need to change that. And horse owners need qualified veterinarians who are there to help them through the fuss of getting your horse to thrive. And in doing so, we fill a valuable uh, portion of the horse's life and the horse owner's life. And that's value that we can be compensated for. And I think veterinarians who might be listening to this podcast have to understand that if they became leaders and helped horses thrive in a human world, they would actually be adding to the value of their practice. Um, and that's what I try to do. Every time I go and float horses' teeth, I spend time talking about nutrition. And it was fascinating because one of my clients, a new client, is an equine nutritionist, and we had a very large discussion on nutrition. And while we were both competent and wanted the same thing, I call it the AB versus the BA, which comes first. And my theory is that because we're so low in protein, that we can't make a good hoof, we can't make a good immune system, we can't make good neurotransmitters. And her philosophy is because we're so low in, elect in minerals um, <clears throat> and that we need the sugars to make the minerals work, um, that that was necessary. And I said, look, we need each other. We need the minerals and we need the proteins together. We can't ignore one and put one higher than the other. And I've always said we're getting plenty of minerals through our um, mined salt blocks and water. Um, 
and that the deficiencies of a lot of these minerals being taken up is the lack of ligands, and the ligands are molecules that help chelate the minerals to be, get them drawn across the gut wall. And the number one ligand are amino acids, which brings us back to if you're low on amino acids, meaning low on protein, you're not going to have all the absorption of all the minerals. And so it's a big circle. We go around and around. It depends on what side of the circle you want to be on will determine what your beliefs are. So um, that's the problem with equine nutritionists. Uh, and I hate to say this, and I don't mean to, to be disparaging, but there's no state law in any of our 50 states in America that require you to be an MD or a DVM, a veterinarian or medical doctor, uh, to be a nutritionist. And they all take their studies, and she kept uh, pronouncing the studies as being important. And I know that those who study studies, the PhDs and mathematicians who are looking at these studies, realize that nutritional studies in humans, not horses, not animals, they didn't go there, just in humans, that 0% of them, meaning none of the studies, really have scientific value as far as p-values go or the power of the studies, meaning the number of people that they use in them and the amount of bias that's written into all these studies. Um, the bias, um, here, eat this food and you won't have cancer. And then people cheat. You know, the placebo group starts eating the other foods. There's no... It, it, and the studies don't go long enough. They need to go 10, 20, 30 years and nobody can fund these things. So there's, there's riddled with mathematical errors that make the studies invalid. And I believe the same is true in horses. And because we only use 10, 20, 30 horses in the study and we have agenda driven um, uh, things, things, um, agenda driven data. So um, while most people throw out anecdotal evidence, meaning evidence that's just accumulated through years and years of experience, uh, and we look for the gold standard, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trials, which is considered the gold standard, we also find that there's a lot of um, discrepancies there through bias, through underpowering powered studies, and through uh, p-values that are really not that good. Uh, that's a statistical thing, probability that proves that what you're seeing is actually a connection. Uh, and the and for me, the gold standard is, is there um, causation proved uh, or is it just correlation? I'll give you a great example. According to several people that I've read, um, several studies, there's no correlations between the um, human immunodeficiency virus or HIV and um, acquired immunodeficiency disease or AIDS. And um, that blew blew my mind and blew a lot of people's mind to, to say that you can get AIDS and not have the HIV virus. And that's completely different than what we were all taught. So now we have to ask what's true. And I'll throw another thing out, out there. I'm, I'm studying um, a lot about vaccines in humans and the history of vaccines and some of the detrimental sides of the vaccines uh, worldwide, not just in America, but worldwide. And one of the things I just picked up was uh, we're seeing more narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is you're in the middle of talking, suddenly you just fall asleep uh, as a brain lesion. And horses have been accused of being narcoleptic, but in reality, it's more that they are having this sleep disorder and more and more of it's occurring and nobody can figure it out. But they're now associating narcolepsy in humans with some of the vaccine reactions they're getting. This is to hepatitis or uh, some of the influenza vaccines that are out there. And if that's true, I bet you there'd be a strong correlation to every horse that's had a sleep disorder probably has been vaccinated with some of these multivalent vaccines. Um, now, 
there. I've just started a whole commotion. You know, vaccines cause narcolepsy in horses or horse deficiency syndrome. And I'm not saying that because we can't prove causation. We can only have a correlation. Uh, you can also say all narcoleptic horses are being fed hay, you know, and you'd say, well, yeah, if you're feeding your horse hay, it, it gets sleep disorder. Um, so, but it starts to trigger your mind to start thinking about what other possibilities are out there. And the whole point of the horse's advocate is to dig down deep, separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say, to take, okay, what is not really important? What is causative or, or correlated, but not causative? And scoot that off to the side and start looking at the studies that they're coming up with, these randomized controlled placebo studies. And I'm finding that as I read the journals, I'm finding that there's some really, really smart veterinarians out there, veterinarians and PhDs. There's no doubt they're brilliant. And I just got an invite to come to a, a, a all month lecture series on plate rich plasma, a stem cell therapy, regenerative medicine in horses. And they combine horses and humans to kind of blend together everything. And I find it fascinating because it's a who's who. I know several of the people that are there in here that are leading cutting edge of regenerative medicine. I've known them either in vet school um, or uh, associated out here in practice. And they all know me too. I mean, we're on a first name basis. And, I, and, and they're true geniuses. But where is in all of this how to prevent these injuries in the first place, so we don't have to be injecting uh, stem cells. How do we make our horses stronger? How do we prevent the breakdown of suspensory ligaments or caudal heel pain? How do we prevent all these injuries from occurring in the first place? And nowhere in this esteemed panel does anybody say, hey, let's look at this prevention. So I'm gonna stick with my mission, which is to dig down deep, stop adding, but mostly subtract, and get down into the root causes of most of the diseases that we see. And that's what I want to uh, do here at the Horse Advocate. To help horses thrive in a human world just means that we have to open up our minds to other possibilities and start thinking about what could be and, and allow ourselves to question everything we're told. And um, that's just the way it is. And I know there's going to be some people who get mad at me. And I understand that, and I believe that they can get mad if they want. Uh, but I invite anybody who wants to debate these things to discuss them, to dig down deep. I know that many of you listening to this are smarter than I am, that's for sure. Uh, but are you in a dogma that needs to have a stick of dynamite put in there and blown up and reassess everything? You know, training, um, behavior, um, all these issues that we're looking at, chiropractic, acupuncture, massage therapy, we're getting so many uh, complementary um, medicine approaches to the horse. And yet I still go around asking every veterinarian and every farrier, what makes that stench when you take a hot shoe and apply it to the bottom of the hoof and the smoke billows out? And other than it smells like money, sorry farriers, but that's an old joke. Uh, what's actually making that smell. And I have yet to find anybody tell me exactly what that is. And once they do tell me what it, when I, when I tell them what it is, then we get into how do you feed a horse so it has a good hoof? And nobody's aware of that. Nobody's talking about that. Horses have evolved for 55 million years and have been put it at our service about, 8,000 years, no, 4,000 years ago, maybe five, it depends on who you listen to, 4,000 years, which is just a blip. It's one tick of your clock in the whole history of the world. And we are now in the last millisecond trying to change them and to improve their lives. And the biggest question I've got is, are we actually improving them? Are we actually helping them or are we just helping ourselves in a mistrusted belief system that needs to have a good look at. Because the number of horses here in America have diminished, but the number of horses that are still being used as 
beasts of burden throughout the world are still up there and they deserve to be treated well too, but we don't want them to have the demise of what's happening to our horses here. We actually want them to thrive in a human world. And sometimes that's not to the benefit of the human, it's not to the benefit of her pocketbook, it's to the be benefit of the horse only. And that's the place where we need to get to. To truly help a horse thrive in the human world, we have to take the humans out of the equation, say, okay, look, you're in our world, you're being used for our purposes, and we need to do something about that to make sure that what is happening is to your benefit and not to the horse's benefit. And I'm not a uh, uh, a person. How do I say this? I don't want. I I want to come across in in the right way. I I want to be the thought leader that allows us to think what's right and what's wrong, and not whether you should shoe a horse or not shoe a horse. Use a bit. Don't use a bit. Uh, use a a crop or don't use a crop or spurs or don't use the spurs. That's not my issue here. That's dialogue for somebody else what i'm trying to find is what will make a horse a willing partner what improves us as humans to make us also willing partners so we can work together the horse and the human to move forward and have us both thrive in the human world that's what i'm trying to do here and that's the mission statement of the horse's advocate and thanks for joining me here I know that a lot of people um, like these podcasts. I'm getting good feedback from people as I go from town to town, but I need you to just reach out to that subscribe button and hit it. Um, I'm going to ask you to leave a comment, good or bad. It doesn't matter. I need to know where I stand. I just can't be out here floating around not knowing what I do. Uh, I need kudos, and I also need some critiques. So please take a time, take a moment, and give me some feedback and hit that subscribe button. I think that's really important. Anyway, here's Doc T. I've got to get back out on the road. I've got a few more farms to go to. I'm actually going to be home tonight. Say hallelujah. And, um, uh, and I'm doing fine. More reports coming up. More good podcasts coming up. I've got tons of ideas coming in here. But I would love to hear what you think you'd like to hear so I can add to that. All right, Doc T. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Hey, everyone. Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe? comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review. However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also gonna help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, Go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.